Hello, everyone. I'm Donna Bowles. I'm president of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation chapter of Charlotte Wildlife Stewards. You can find us, of course, on social media. It's down there at the bottom. We have our website, charlottewildlife.org, and we have a Gmail account. So if you have questions or suggestions for programs or anything like that, you can contact us there, and we appreciate any suggestions. Our mission is to create, preserve, protect wildlife habitat through education, and engagement, and enjoyment. And you can see this, these pictures illustrate some of that. The education part of it is our programs. We've had them in person in the past, but of course with COVID, we've gone virtual and we're gonna continue that through January. We hope our February program will be able to have in-person and we're gonna combine that with in-person and online. Um, that'll be a new adventure for us all. And those meetings will be at Sardis Baptist Church, which is at 5811 Sardis Road. Uh, this church has partnered with us. They've been so gracious in letting us use their properties. We're very thankful for that. We've had a couple of I spies there. We hold our leadership team meetings over there in their picnic pavilion. So that's been a real, it's been a blessing to us to share that with them. Uh, that's the education piece. The engagement piece uh, over there on the right, that's from one of our I Spy adventures. We just encourage people to bring their kids. Actually, it's for kids of any age. We've had very mixed groups age-wise, and that's been a lot of fun. Try to get hands-on. We look under logs, and we touch things, and we smell things, and you know, it's just really to get, get people connected with nature. And then the enjoyment part, you see up there the kayaking, that's from our annual fundraiser, which is called Wild on the Water. We've had to cancel the last two, but we have our fingers crossed. We'll have it on June 11th on Mountain Island Lake this year. And um, there will be more information coming on that. But that's one, of the, that's one of the fun things that we do. Plus there are other events we do where we get together that are fun. We'll talk about those a little bit later. Um, one of the things that, as a chapter, that we really promote, um, because we are in a city and, you know, there's obviously lots of development, lots of things going on, is creating wildlife habitats in our yard. There's a lot of fragmentation with all the development, and so what we can do to help mitigate that is to create habitat in our own yards and hopefully encourage our neighbors, and then we get, you know, we get some corridors for the animals and so that there's you know, they're not just isolated to one little spot. Um, we do have a lot of diverse wildlife in Charlotte and actually next month's program will be about just that topic. But to create a wildlife habitat, this is a program of the National Wildlife Federation and, and what they require is what you see over here on the left, food, water, places to raise their young, shelter, sustainable practices. Food can be in a natural form as you see there in the photo of the Black Eyed Susans, or you can have supplemental feeders. We do kind of recommend you don't leave, you know, your pet food out or that you encourage things like raccoons or that sort of thing, because that can become problematic. But, but you know, having, you know, you can throw peanuts out for squirrels or, you know, have your bird feeders up. Water, of course, every living thing needs. Um, bird baths, if you have a natural water source, that's, that's really wonderful. Places to raise your young and shelter kind of go hand in hand. Those can also be in the form of uh, natural, as in trees and shrubbery and ground covers. I put up a birdhouse like she has done here. Also, you could do bat houses, owl houses. Those are all things that can be put up. Sustainable practices, of course, that's talking about not using pesticides, letting nature kind of balance those things, those issues out using um, herbicides very judiciously, maybe putting in a rain barrel, uh, mulching with plants rather than kind of mulch, uh, using your leaves as mulch. And then you can go on this National Wildlife Federation website and can actually certify your property as a wildlife habitat. And you can purchase a sign to put up and get your neighbors all interested and then you can get them doing it. What that leads me into is this Homegrown National Park. This is an idea of Doug Tallamy. A lot of you have probably heard of him, and if you haven't, you need to know about him. He is a professor at University of uh, Delaware, an entomologist, and 
things he talks about is just amazing. And we need to do more than just, you know, a lot of us, it's like preaching to the choir. We need to get this word out. And what this idea is, goes right along with the certified wildlife habitat, is we've got the ability to bring nature home, which is the title of one of his books, you know, just bring nature right into our backyard, that we don't have to go to a to the national park or whatever, we've got it there. And, um, and that's what we need to do. And we can do that in several different ways. One of the, the big things is we want to plant, have plants in our yards that are going to support the greatest diversity of wildlife. Oak trees, the native oak trees, you don't want, you know, you don't want European oaks or whatever, you want native American oaks. And those support 557 different species of caterpillars. And why is that important? Because caterpillars take the energy that plants make that, that they produce from the sun and they convert it into a food source that's going to be a food source for birds, for, you know, other animals. They're one of the most important food sources that's out there, you know, and then other insects are going to use these. And I could go on and on, but our time is limited. The other thing you can do is reduce your lawn. That is a sterile environment. It does not support wildlife. And it takes, it takes a lot of work and money to keep a lawn going. One of the things we can do is leave the leaves. Um, that's nature's way of replenishing the soil. It makes new soil as they break down. It produces a place for wildlife to live. A lot of of our insect species over winter in leaf litter, a lot of caterpillars, they'll wrap up in leaves, which also leads me to say, I've seen a lot of this is really limit or stop using leaf blowers. The force that comes out of those kills a lot of these small animals that are in that leaf litter. Break it, you know, it's good exercise. But by leaving the leaves, we're just doing what nature intends for that. Be a messy gardener. What do I mean by that? You know, you planted all these uh, things. You planted Joe Pye weed and you planted coneflowers and black-eyed Susans. Well, birds in the fall and winter eat those leaves. It's an important food source for birds. A lot of native bees will, will nest in the stems. So if you have to cut them back, if you really have to, leave about 12 inches. That's enough that's enough space for those bees to get in and, and make their nests in an overwinter. Um, if you have to, put a little sign in your yard explaining to your neighbors why your garden looks like it does. But just, just because the plants are dead, they're, they're, they're really sleeping because a lot of these are perennials. There's still life going on in that garden. And then the other you know, important thing is to eliminate pesticides. Let, let the natural predators take care of those sorts of things. Uh, there is a website called Homegrown National Park that you can go to and get more information on this. It's a grass. It's, this is a grassroots movement. That's why a lot of things start and become successes. So you can go there. There's, you, you also on that website have the ability to go in and put your zip code in and mark mark your yard as one of these homegrown national parks. And you know if we can get if we can get more of this going countrywide. It's just going to make so much difference for our environment. What are some ways that um, be involved, uh, you know, not just in your own backyard, but in your community? Uh, we at Charlotte Wildlife Stewards do different events out in the community, and we always need extra hands. There are just a few of us, and we can't do everything on our own, although, you know, we, we try to do what we can. Um, as you can see this quote here about volunteering, you know, when you get out there and lend your hand in, then, you know, then you are making a difference. This slide is from a project where um, we partnered with Stormwater and, well, this is Charlotte Wildlife Stewards and North Carolina Wildlife Federation. We put up eight nesting boxes at the Wildlife or Chantilly Ageological Sanctuary, which is an area that Stormwater went in there and did a lot of work of rerouting the creek back to its natural flow, meandering, put in wildflower meadows, planted native trees. It's a great project. There's still work there that's ongoing that we are involved in. We do have two volunteer events coming up. The Pollinator Garden Installations Habitat Restoration Project, which is 
kind of like to say what it was trees for trash. I know you've heard me talk about that, um, going out and getting trash out of the environment. And then for every 25 pounds of trash that's collected, reported into North Carolina Wildlife Federation on their website, then a native tree or up to 10 native plants will get planted for every 25 pounds. Great thing. I mentioned wild on the water. We have Kids in Nature Day, which just a couple weekends ago, we had 200 kids come out to Reedy Creek Park and enjoy all these hands-on activities. And it was, it was so much fun. And we will have another one next fall, but we had, I think, nine partner organizations. We had 16 activities overall, and we had 18 volunteers that helped carry, carry off this day, and everybody had a great time. And other events and activities, which um, here they are. So on this coming Saturday, we are getting up a team to go to this Tree Charlotte event at University Meadows Elementary School. They have like I want to say 320 or 340 trees to plant and that's a lot of trees and I mean they're looking for a total of 200 volunteers they're, they're still in need of volunteers I think we have about eight people signed up I'd really like to see more so you know if you like digging if you like well I'm hoping they'll have a lot of the holes dug but if you like um, you know getting out and doing things it's going to be a beautiful day we can get out there and really make a difference. This will be great because the kids at the school, you know, they're gonna they're gonna see this. They're gonna see that trees are important. They're gonna get to watch them grow, see wildlife, you know, come to their campus, and just, you know, it's just a great thing to do. So you got some time Saturday morning. There's a link there where you can sign up, or you can go to our Facebook page to the events, and you can sign up through there. Uh, the next event we have is gonna be at the Eastway Regional Recreation Center. It's a new recreation center um, and it's fabulous. They have a, a nature room over there. They have a, a planting for pollinators event. So Alden is one of our board members and he actually works at this rec center and he's heading up this, this um, planting event. What we're gonna do is be adding pollinator plants to their meadow and it's 10 to noon. And again, there's the sign up link, or you can go to our Facebook page and the events, and there's a place to sign up there. If you like playing in the dirt like I do, come and have fun with us. So what we have coming up in November, our November program is Wildlife in Mecklenburg County, the Myths and Misconceptions. And I learned a new word about that. It's gonna be about animals that are Synentropic, and what that means is animals that live with humans and actually benefit from living. They're wild animals that live in the same environment with humans. So Marvin Bachnight will be our speaker that night, and um, he's a really engaging, interesting, and enthusiastic presenter. Then on November Sunday, November 21st at 3 p.m., we're going to have our I Spy Nature Walk, and um, I mentioned this. It's for Actually, kids of all ages, this is one of my favorite little pictures. It's my twin grandkids when they were two and a half years old at Every Place Nature um, investigating the pond. And what we want is, is kids and anybody just get down there, have hands on, you know, feel it, smell it, don't taste it. But anyway, so Ernie, would you like to talk about our fun, exciting news? I'll be real brief on this because I'm sure people want to hear the, the presentation, but the, the Charlotte Wildlife Stewards recently were an, awarded a, a grant from the North Carolina Native Plant Society for $1,000. And we are using those funds in collaboration with the Mecklenburg County Stormwater Services to enhance our project location out at Chantilly Ecological Sanctuary. So we will be drawing up plans and um, implementing them into the pond area to enhance and um, it'll include an educational component for the Monastery School there and there's an apartment complex there as well. So we're real excited to have that grant to increase our educational wildlife habitat restoration program that we do across uh, Charlotte. So more will be coming on that soon too. Thank you, Donna. Okay, thank you, Ernie. Now we're gonna turn it over 
to, let me see, to Dave, Matthew, Josh, and Hannah, who are environmental specialists with Charlotte Stormwater. And they're going to talk to us about the stream, the restorations that they do, how they do it, why they do it, what the benefits are. So I'm going to turn it over to them and they will be introducing themselves and, you know, give you a little background on each of that But before we go ahead. So we'll introduce ourselves real quick and then we'll start into the presentation. Uh, we'll kind of go around our little table here and talk about who we are. Uh, obviously, we work for Charlotte Mecklenburg Stormwater Services. We do a lot of different things, but what we're going to talk about today is our kind of newly revamped and, and bodacious stream restoration program that's all involved around most of our groups. So we'll go into that and I'll let Mr. Josh Damari talk to you about him for a second. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Josh Damari. Um, I'm an environmental coordinator here at Charlotte Networks Water Services in the Water Quality Division, which is where all of us are. And um, I've been here for about five years, and my primary purpose here is stream restoration, mitigation monitoring, and um, stream morphology. I'm uh, Matthew Phillips. I've been uh, with the stormwater services uh, about six years, a little over, and I'm with their monitoring group, monitoring team. And uh, with that, as kind of the name says, we monitor a lot of the, the water around here from lake monitoring, routine monitoring to routine sampling on our streams to uh, one of the, the specialty areas I'm involved in is our benthic macroinvertebrate collection, which is our, our bugs and our creeks, which uh, we'll cover in this presentation some here coming up. But uh, I'm one of the taxonomists that will go out and collect the bugs and identify them. And um, I'm a apprentice at learning algae identification too, trying to trying to get that learned up. But um, those are some of my primary tasks here with the with the county. And you see Matt right there with a big wad of hydrilla. So Matt's our aquatic veg master. He's taught me a whole lot about aquatic weeds on the lake. So that's a great picture of him showing you what Lake Norman hydrilla looked like a couple of years ago. So go ahead, Miss Hannah. Uh, hi, I'm Hannah. I've been with the county about two years now, and um, I work with Josh a lot on morphology, or I'm learning from Josh a lot on uh, stream morphology and mitigation monitoring, and I also coordinate our stream walk program, um, where we walk most of the streams in the county looking for um, pollution sources, uh, wetlands, all kinds of different things. Okay, and the loud mouth you're hearing now, I'm Dave Ferguson. Everybody calls me shaky, so feel free. Um, I basically run our lake monitoring program and all things routine and non-routine with that. Uh, we're dealing with lots of different stuff on all three of the lakes. That's Norman, Mountain Island, and Wiley. And also, I've been fortunate enough to take over our fish monitoring program where we rotate most of the major system creeks uh, throughout the county every three to four years. And we go and do a fish assessment for uh, the same reaches that we do our bugs and our water quality sampling. So it all kind of gets to tie together. But my favorite thing in the world to look at is fish. So I was fortunate enough to take that on this year. And as you can see by the smile right there, that was my first day using my brand new fish guide. So really excited about that. So we'll move on. And I'm gonna let Mr. Josh take over for a little while. Yeah, I'll stop the video so they won't get distracted by us in the comments. All right, so um, I'm just going to start off, um, give a little bit of overview of stream restoration, what it is, um, why we must do it. Um, I'll go into each of those bullets here in a second, but then Hannah will go into a little bit about the vegetation uh, plantings once we restore a stream and kind of go into the planning plans and what we look at how things are put in the ground and then Dave and Matt will get to the fun stuff with the fish and bugs um, so just starting off um, really I wanted to preface with what stream restoration is um, so the best definition I could find online was based on this um, article called what is the river and uh, so stream restoration in a nutshell is river restoration, which is sometimes often considered river reclamation. Um, and so it's work to improve the environmental health of a river system in support of biodiversity, recreation, any type of flood management or landscape development. Um, so with that, um, I'll lead in with three different bullets, why we must do it, 
how we restore, and what are we doing locally um, to help with biodiversity, flood management, and whatnot. So the second here is why we have to do it. So the first uh, picture in the left-hand screen is the population census tract. So as you can tell, going from left to right, it's from the 1990s to 2010. I didn't have the 2020 data. Um, but this just shows population uh, density in Mecklenburg County. So as you can tell, the red has drastically increased. So based on the Charlotte Business Journal in 2020, we're averaging 91 people per day are moving to the great state of Mecklenburg or something <laughs> to the east of us say. Um, so with that um, comes urbanization of the watershed. Um, so the exhibit to your right is the 2021 impervious surface map that our GIS department um, on a daily basis is updating because there's so much development going on. So as you can tell, 22% of our land area is impervious surfaces in Mecklenburg County. So a quarter of that um, cannot permeate water, um, which is kind of crazy. Um, so obviously urbanization changes the water cycle. Um, so the city of Griffin had a great exhibit showing um, evapotransportation um, in the entire water cycle as it reduces infiltration um, and which increases the water volume to our streams. So with the increase of the water volume um, comes a whole nother um, thing of concern. So the second step is the stream dynamics. So how does the channel respond to this type of change? Um, so on the left hand side of the screen is Simon's channel evolution model. Um, so a channel, in a nutshell, can go through six different stages of um, evolution to alleviate energy um, based on water volume that is given to it. Um, so the picture in the middle shows a, a stage or class three channel where you have significant degradation going on, where the channel has not, or the, excuse me, the water has not hit a restrictive layer to allow it um, to widen the channel. So it's going to continue down cutting until it hits a, a hard pan of some sort and then start going east and west. Um, so the picture on the right is a stage five um, channel, which is definitely over widened. So it's already hit its point that it can no longer degrade with incision. And now it goes to the left or right. So it's got to a point where now it can't move the amount of sediment that is coming to it. So now you have all these types of massive depositional features of um, input um, from the water yield that is coming to the channel. Um, so those are two things of why we really have to get on um, board with going stream restoration. Um, because as you can tell, this channel right here um, doesn't have a lot of great habitat um, for the bugs and fish. So the second step is how do we restore? Um, so we at Mecklenburg County use a natural channel design approach. Um, hopefully some of y'all have heard of this. If not, um, it was developed by a man called Dave Roskin. Um, and his primary folks, he used to work with the Forest Service, but he was an avid fly fisherman who always wanted to create better fish habitat. Um, so when he worked for the Forest Service, uh, he would go out and measure all kinds of different empirical uh, relationship data um, with the channel of what it was doing. Um, so he has two great publications called the Classification of Natural Rivers and the Watershed Assessment for River Stability and Sediment Supply, which is WARS. Um, so if you need some nightcap reading, um, <laughs> these two right here are great um, pieces of material to read. Um, so with the natural channel design approach, the stream restoration and it emulates a natural river system. So what we use is a, a reference reach, which is a stable system that has the same sediment flow regime into the channel that is degraded that we're wanting to restore. So there are 67 variables that are predicted by this natural channel design that actually cannot be accurately predicted using other kinds of analytical models. Um, 
um, the other folks um, use two stabilized channels. So with that being said, how do we restore? There's three parts of the channel design. So we have the dimension, which is the shape of the channel. Um, we have the profile, which is the channel bed form. So that's the riffles, pools, runs. Um, and then also we have the pattern, which is the channel sinuosity. These are all married together. So it's a tripod. As one changes, the other adjusts to stabilize as well. Um, so with understanding that and the valley constraints that are in an urban environment, um, we are able to effectively stabilize streams and provides a functional uplift to the channel and provide habitat. Um, so I just want to show three different priorities of restoration. Um, so the first one from the top to the bottom um, is a priority one restoration where you have the incised channel and you fill that channel in with a plug. Um, you create, you put the channel back to existing floodplain um, and you stabilize it with different types of vegetation and structures. Um, a priority two restoration is where you have some type of constraints such as a building or a roadway or something like that, um, but you have a wide enough valley, you're able to fill in, cut and fill that channel to, a, to create a new floodplain. Um, so it is able to alleviate that type of energy um, and still create a stabilized channel in that new um, floodplain. And then our priority three is where you're really confined so you have to do more cut um, and you stabilize the channel in its current existing condition um, and use a various array of structures and vegetation to stabilize it in that certain condition. So I just want to hit those real quick because we'll kind of go over those again in some of our case studies as we move forward. Um, so the next thing is what are we doing locally? Um, so right off the bat, um, 226 out of 263 miles in Charlotte Mecklenburg are impaired or polluted. Um, our predominant impairment is aquatic life, so that means poor fish and bugs. Um, primary cause of that is obviously non point source pollution, such as sediment, uh, which is stream bank runoff, um, and obviously the amount of water that's coming from urbanization, um, which degrades the channels, resulting in poor habitat. So the figure on the right. Uh, everything in red is what is degraded. So that can be somewhat um, alarming um, to some, um, but we're, uh, we're doing our best to get that uh, number down. So um, approximately since 2003, we have put about 30 miles of stream restoration uh, in the ground. Um, there is an interactive web map uh, that is on our website that you can go and look um, at some of our rest or most of our restoration projects, it gives the project manager um, how much it costs, what was done uh, for functional uplift and habitat. Um, we can provide you that link here um, or uh, after the fact as well. So this this web based map uh, highlights the city and county projects um, that are going on within the county itself. Um, so it's a really cool tool if you really want to see what's going on across the city um, currently um, and in the past. So the next thing I want to hone in really is what we're doing at the county level um, with Mecklenburg Stormwater Services. So we have a water quality capital improvement project program, so water quality CIP. Um, so our why statement is to stabilize stream channels and restore habitat so that the water quality improves, the stream, the stream will be able to support a diverse aquatic community, which includes your fish and bugs. Um, so how we're going to try to approach this initiative is with what is called our stream restoration ranking system, which is SIRS. This just got endorsed uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, so this is a data-driven approach for the selection, monitoring, and scoring of current and future water quality CIP projects. Um, so the figure to your right is called the String Function Pyramid, uh, which is created by Will Harmon. And we kind of follow this model, and you'll see these um, peers um, in some of the later slides. But first of all, to get us moved in the right direction, we do have a SERS desktop 
which is a GIS evaluation approach that our county planner uses to help select projects based on a GIS data set that we have. Um, I won't go into travel detail about that, but it at least gets us going in the right direction. So the SERS field score, which I said follows Will Harmon's pyramid, is a blended scoring mechanism between channel stability and habitat. So we're looking at both things to fill in these tiers within this pyramid. So going into the service field score, we have we score our projects based on a 300 point scale. Um, it's a blended score, like I said, between channel stability and habitat analysis. To the right, um, you see the functional pyramid stages that we look at. So, um, so there are nine assessment categories um, that we look at, and there's 13 field analysis. So right off the bat, hydrology. Um, as what I said before, the watershed is the hardest thing to control as the amount of urbanization is going on. So as a whole, we have programmatic goals and ordinances to help us promote this type of hydrologic uplift. So then as far as like I talked about before, the channel shape, uh, which is also called the string dimension, we look at empirical relationships. I won't go to travel detail about that, but they hit the hydraulics and the geomorphology. Um, same thing with the stream profile, which is our ripple pool sequencing. Um, we look at those measurables. Um, obviously, our pattern is the other leg that I talked about, um, which is our sinuosity. We look at that. Um, we look at buffer, our buffer quality and quantity. How wide is our buffer? Uh, how much impervious surfaces within that? Um, so that's a scoreable for us. Um, bank vegetation protection. Um, which is a part of the MHAP process that Matt and Shake will go into in the future slides. Um, and then we also look at bank erosion and nutrients reduction, um, which is the current bank stability and nutrients concentration. So that hits on geomorphology and physiochemical. And then we go to the top tier, which is more of the biology. So we look at the in-stream cover, the epiphonal substrate, and the base flow water availability for the bugs. So we hit everything. And uh, right now we have a 20 year monitoring initiative that we're wanting to do with these projects moving forward to really show the amount of uplift um, that we are expecting to see uh, in our stream restoration projects. Um, so with that being said, um, I'm gonna lead into um, Hannah's section. So, before we can even measure any of this, we got to put vegetation in the ground to stabilize the banks and get the channel to uh, stabilize uh, itself. You can click or scroll, whichever you're most comfortable with on the left window. Okay. Yeah. There we go. All right, um, so I'm just going to touch a little bit on um, stream bank stabilization using vegetation. So in our projects, we really try to use native species. Um, and that's one of our key ways of not only stabilizing stream banks post construction, but also in general. Um, we use when we design the planting plans, um, they're in different zones, and that's largely driven by hydrology. And I'll get into that a little more later. Um, when we do replant our stream bank, we try to make seed mixes and choose species um, that include early successional species and later successional or climax community species. Um, we want to design stuff that will be able to actually not just survive, but thrive in these environments. It, it doesn't always happen, but a lot of the times post-construction can be really harsh for plants. Um, they have full sunlight, they've lost a lot of shade, the soil could be compacted, um, they get inundated a lot in these areas. So we really try to pick things that we think will survive. Um, and we also try to take note of invasive species that are just present or already becoming a big problem. Um, so and planting different types of successional species, I, I put natural in quotations. Because uh, we work in urban systems, so mm -hmm. it's really hard to determine, you know, what natural is for urban systems because they've changed so much over time. But um, basically, we want to get a good functioning 
vegetative community that also helps at other ecological levels. Um, and once our vegetation becomes established, uh, native root systems develop, they really deepen and help us work toward our goal of long-term bank stability. It also helps us reduce things like scour um, and other erosive forces that can degrade the stream banks. Um, and then once our vegetation is established, it helps you know, other ecological benefits. It can replenish soil nutrients. You reduce water temperatures with shade that helps fish and other aquatic life. Um, they provide a source for plant litter, habitat, biomass, food um, for fish and aquatic macroinvertebrates. Um, so just some quick things that we try to take into consideration when we think about our planting plants for our projects. Um, one, we want to look at what species to plant, how many of each. Uh, a lot of times we're using seed mixes, we're using live stake cuttings, um, bare roots, or um, other potted plants. So we want to go to a reference reach, which is a stable, usually a stable steam stream reach within the same watershed, and kind of compare to get an idea of um, what our stream might look like had it not been so altered and degraded. Um, we also want to get an idea of existing vegetative community types, um, what species are there, native and invasive. And this will help us later um, for managing invasive species, trying to develop treatments for them, um, maybe understanding our seed bank and what we might get naturally just through recruitment. Um, and we also want to understand existing features on our project, like wetlands and things like that. Um, two, we want to think about possible soil amendments and treatments that might help our plants survive. Um, did the soil get really compacted? Do we need to um, aerate anything? Do we need to add any sort of nutrients? And we do have to be really careful when we do stuff like that. Um, what kind of matting do we want to use? We usually use core matting, which is a coconut fiber. Um, we want to think about timing when we're doing our plantings so that our plants can survive, um, you know, thinking about limiting factors like light, temperature, soil moisture. Um, for instance, like with our live state cuttings, we usually plant those October through March. They have a pretty wide window um, of their dormant season when we can plant them. Uh, locations and our planting zones, we wanna think about how we're gonna seed and how our different, you know, um, methodologies there. We want to develop a monitoring plan so that we can look at the success of our projects and see how well the vegetation is doing over time. Um, and then also uh, kind of determine what the contractor is responsible for maintenance wise. Like if a plant dies, you know, how, how many years are they responsible for replacing it? Um, Okay, and then just touching on some of our, our vegetation zones. So we, we divide them into zones based on pre and post, construct, post construction conditions. Um, most of our plants will have really detailed instructions for soil prep, seeding, and we use temporary and permanent seeding on most projects and also planting. Um, you'll see different zones. You get riparian zones, which include the floodplain, stream bank zones, which is usually like right at the stream bank where you have a lot of um, inundation, wetland areas, and then also uh, drier upland areas. And here's an example, it might be hard to see, um, but this is an example of a planting plan from one of our projects. So you can see it's really broken down. We have like riparian seeding, temporary seeding, it's broken down by species. Um, percentage in the mix, uh, the wetland classification, it has all kinds of detailed information. And then the um, code for how you're gonna see it in the plan. So, you know, you'll have this key and then you go to our plans and it's gonna look something like this. So you can actually look at your project and see where you want to plant um, each mix or where you wanna put your bare roots or what have you.
Um, so some of the techniques that we use for establishing vegetation, um, we can use vegetated geoliths or another variation of that is a geogrid. So your image is on the right. This is a geolift that's been um, cut into the bank before planting and then kind of what it looks like after. So they really help stabilize the outside vents of the stream. Um, you're gonna have layers of overlapping soil lifts with erosion control matting. Um, and usually you're gonna use on-site soils. You don't want to bring in extra soil if you don't have to. Um, you can put live stakes or they're basically cuttings from woody native species in the layers in between the lifts. You can kind of see some here, it's a little fuzzy, but there are live stakes um, in between the layers there. Uh, and a stone toe or toe wood base is usually installed um, at the bottom to provide extra protection and give the geolift a really solid foundation. Um, other techniques uh, are erosion control um, and seed mixes. So seeding helps with immediate soil protection. So that's one of the first things that we do is just get seed on the ground. Um, we break it down into temporary mixes, which are, they can be applied very quickly. They're usually inexpensive compared to permanent mixes. Um, and then we use that in conjunction with tree and shrub plantings to work toward long-term stability. Um, so your temporary mix is usually something like, I have an example one up here, um, you know, 40% maybe of an annual bluegrass, 50% of a perennial ryegrass, you know what, 5% of so, maybe like a hardier grass, and then um, a non-invasive herb that's just naturalized, like a, like a white clover, um, for example, something that could fix nitrogen and also help um, soil nutrients. And then later, or I mean, you could do it immediately too, we have permanent seed mixes that are really specific to the hydrology and the planting zones. Um, they're going to have a lot of wetland species, usually a lot of like large variety of native grasses, um, native herbs that have wildlife benefit um, for pollinators, birds, everything. And also they'll provide an aesthetic value for our stakeholders. And you can see to the right, um, this is a picture at Stevens Creek Nature Preserve. This was a really good seed mix and you have all kinds of um, seasonal native grasses and wildflowers. That one turned out really nicely. Um, another method is bank revegetation. So native trees and shrubs and grasses um, develop better root systems and they can withstand erosive capacity much better. Um, the main one that we use would be live stakes. So you can kind of see right here uh, some instructions for live stakes and here's what they look like stuck into the stream bank. But they're basically cuttings from native woody plants and they go directly into the stream bank during their dormant growth period. Um, they're harvested when they're dormant as well. And they get planted in North Carolina. You can plant them really October through March. Um, they're gonna be about two to three feet long half an inch to two inches in diameter. And you're gonna wanna put them in the ground um, about two thirds of the way right into the stream bank. And you'll cut the end that goes into the stream bank at a roughly 45 degree angle. Um, one of the really important things here is the soil and bark contact because that will help stimulate root growth. Um, common species that we use, silky willow. Um, you see black willow on a lot of projects too. Silky dogwood, buttonbush, elderberry. Um, and one thing that's really cool about live stakes is you can get roots, buds, and leaves all within one growing season. And they're really cheap, they're easy to get. They're, they're a really great resource to use on these projects. Um, and they also help hold the matting down, just win-win situation. Um, we also use bare roots and container trees. So um, pros and cons, bare roots, they're less expensive, but they have a bit of a shorter planting season because they're literally what they sound like. You get the plant and that has no soil, it's just bare roots. Um, container plants, they're gonna be a lot more expensive. You can use them year round typically. Um, but you know, it kind of just depends on your budget and what you wanna use for your project. 
And then some of the last techniques I'm going to talk about are more bioengineering techniques. So these are going to incorporate um, riparian vegetation and woody cuttings installed into the bank. Um, this one right here, they're fasting bundles. They're also called wattles, um, but sometimes wattles can be used interchangeably with, with other things. But basically you have, um, you create these bundles of live stakes and you kind of put them into these trenches and they help create a terrace on the, or um, a terrace within the bank um, and provide stability. Right here, you have an example of brush mattresses. So they literally, you, um, sort of weave live cuttings together and they get placed directly into the bank, um, secured with twine, other live stakes and dead stakes. And they come in really handy where you have high flows that can do a lot of damage um, before vegetation can be established, which on a restoration project, ideally that's eliminated anyway. But if you're just doing maybe some patch restoration, these can be really helpful. Um, the last one I'm going to talk about are brush layers. They're also, it's also called live brush layering. It kind of looks similar to your geoliths, but you basically have horizontal alternating layers of soil and live branches, um, and it sort of reinforces a bench along the bank. Um, and it helps where you have slumping or loosened soil if you ever had to go in and cut and fill or anything like that. Um, another one we commonly use is tow wood, but I'm going to let Matt and Dave talk a little more about that. Thank you, Matt. Okay, so real quick, I'm going to give a quick little intro and then Maddie's going to take over for me for a second. So one thing I've come to learn here, and I think we've kind of learned in the group, is to get biological diversity in your streams of your fish and your bugs, because that's what we're trying to monitor throughout. It seems like we have to have these three pillars underneath us to be in good shape. So water quality, no pollution in the water, no chemicals in the water. It affects fish gills. It affects how these bugs breathe through their skin. All these other things that, that bugs and fish can't handle, they'll get up and leave. They'll swim downstream. They'll die. The adults won't lay their eggs there, what have you. And water quantity, like Josh has already talked about, when this stream gets destroyed, there's hardly any habitat and the water can't push the sediment out. So there's hardly any water in the old stream channel anymore. It's basically widened into a huge dirt gutter that we can't even utilize the water we have in the natural stream itself. And then habitat. So if we lose habitat, there's no place for these things to live, no matter how much water we have or how clean water we have, they're not going to be there. So what we're going to kind of focus on today with stream restoration is how it affects the habitat for the fish and the bugs. And I'm going to let Maddie talk about that a little bit real quick. Yeah, we'll go into um, our habitat assessment and then kind of our bug sampling methodology. But uh, before I get into all that real quick, as I mentioned um, earlier in our intro, that uh, do a lot of the benthic macroinvertebrate sampling in our streams. And what that entails is we call it bugging. We collect the bugs in the streams. Um, as many of y'all, I'm sure, are well aware, a lot of our terrestrial insects have a larval form that starts off in the aquatic environment, a pond, lake, stream, or whatever. Mosquitoes, everyone knows that. Dragonflies, a lot of people are familiar with that one. Um, they start off their life in our streams. And all these, these critters are very specific to not only the habitat that they, that they thrive in, they need, they're very endemic to certain isolated areas of a stream. They need certain habitat types, they need certain flow, they need certain water quality, they need a lot of variables in order to survive in our streams. And uh, so what we do is we go out and we have, depending on the year, roughly 30 dedicated sites in our stream drum in County that we sample on a yearly basis. And some of these streams we've been sampling for 20, 30 years. 30 we've years. got a lot yeah. of data on it, a whole lot of data on their streams. And it's just a tool we use in our toolbox to help assess overall water quality and stream health. Um, most of our sampling sites are overlaid with sites that, that Shaky might do electrofishing at. They're overlaid with what we call our, our continuous monitoring network, our CMAN network that takes real-time readings of stream conditions. A lot of them have a USGS stations at them, so we can look at flow dynamics. Um, and a lot of them are dedicated uh, fixed interval monitoring where we'll go out once a month and just collect water quality um, from, these, from these sites. So Based off all those, those tools I just mentioned, it can kind of paint a good picture of what exactly is going on in our streams and in these different areas of our streams. And uh, all the, um, the, uh, the aquatic organisms have, and I'll get into this a little bit more in the, the talk, have a, um, a tolerance value, pre-assigned pre tolerance value that 
the EPA has come up with a long time ago. And uh, basically bugs that are very intolerant that need gin clear water, that nice pristine mountain stream have a tolerance value of zero. They need the cleanest of the clean. And then you have the organisms that can live in a puddle on a concrete parking lot and they have a tolerance value of 10. So they can survive in anything. So based off the makeup of all the bugs you might find in a stream, it puts forth the biotic indices and I can kind of tell you, give you a health reading of that stream based off of the biota of insects that are there. But at all our sites, our dedicated monitoring sites, we do habitat assessments. And uh, again, the EPA has developed the stream habitat assessment protocol that different entities, municipalities, government agencies, whatever, use it as a template, and kind of morph it into how it might work in their environment, their area. So for us as Piedmont, mainly dealing with Piedmont streams, we kind of morphed it into that so it works for our streams here in Mecklenburg County. About, I guess, five, four or five years ago, our original stream habitat assessment and uh, the EPA guideline was very um, subjective. It's very, very open, very qualitative as far as the habitat types. And uh, when you assess these streams, you're in them 100 meter stretches. You're assessing the habitat only within a dedicated 100 meters. And uh, before it'd be, again, very objective, where you might just say, oh, there were lots of ripples. Well, exactly how many ripples? Whereas before just saying lots, now we're physically measuring that. Especially as Josh mentioned, this new SERS initiative that's come down a year and a half, two years old, we needed to be a lot more quantitative, a lot more specific with the habitat that we're in these streams, especially when it comes to restoration. We need to be able to say, this is how many ripples were there. This is the quality of the ripple before and after. Or this is how many root wads we found before and after to really show that difference of, um, of pre and post restoration. So with all of that said, now I can get into more meat of it. Oh, got to click on this side. These are our forms that we use um, to do our habitat assessments. And as I mentioned, there are 100 meters dedicated reaches. And we try to do 100 meters that represents that entire reach. You know, a lot of our projects might be miles long. Some of them might be short, just maybe a mile, a half mile, a little fix here or there where a lot of our restoration projects encompass many miles. So if that's the case, we might have to do two or three habitat assessments throughout this entire restoration project to capture what is best representative of this reach or of this project. We just don't pick, throw a dart at the map and pick 100 meters and call it good. We wanna make sure we're representing what is most likely out there stream conditions. Um, this is our transect form right here, and it starts here at the bottom at zero meters. So starting at zero meters, 20 meters, 40, 60, 80, all the way up to 100, we do a transect across the stream where we measure the channel width and the wetted width. So the channel, and what we say channel and what Josh refers to as channel can be two very different things. But for our purposes and the habitat standpoint, our channel width is where the water normally should be during normal flow conditions. And usually that's about the vegetation line. So about where the vegetation ends and you might have some mud and then you have your water. You might have a bar or whatever the case is. That's about what we do with channel. Again, urban streams can be tricky, especially ones that have been rip-wrapped, have gabions, or even severe erosion. They're just straight up and down. It can be sometimes difficult to say, well, what is a channel? Because there really isn't a channel anymore. It's, it's been altered. And then the wetted width is the actual water that is in the channel. Um, we measure that. And then with our wetted width, we divide it by 10. So if we have, uh, you know, 10 or 10 meters across, divided by 10, every meter will go into a pebble count and water depth. So at every meter increment, if it is that case, we'll say, all right, we're at water depth of 0.5 and we have sand, 0.7, we have gravel, we have cobble. So we're doing cross sections, quantifying our pebble count and substrate height throughout this reach. And again, we, we do these at, at dedicated points and we'll do them at the same points year in and year out. So if we say, this is where we're doing our 100 meter habitat assessment, the next year we'll do that exact same 100 meters. We're not gonna deviate off that 100 meters. So we're getting that that consistency from year in and year out. So that's our um, our transect form right there. And we also, if you notice here, kind of on the side, some of this might be hard to see, I know within these 20 meter stretches, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, we're looking at the bank and seeing that there's vegetation cover there, seeing what the erosion aspects might be. Same with over here, we're looking at backwater, percent exposed sediment. Your sediment's your loose stuff, your sand. If it's boulders, bedrock, things like that, that's stable, we're not concerned about that. We're concerned about the stuff that can get moved. So um, that's what we're looking at for the um, exposed sediment. And then over here is the actual habitat counts. And as I mentioned before, our previous habitat assessments were very um, subjective and kind of objective is that we just said, oh, there might be lots of something or there might be 10% of something. Well, now we actually take measurements. And as I get along, we'll see if one of these forms filled out. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, your pools and ripples, leaf packs, these types of microhabitats here, we do physical counts. All right, we started in a pool and we're walking upstream. All right, we entered a run, so we'll put a tick mark at a run. All right, we got back into a pool, so we'll do a tick mark in a pool again. Same with leaf packs. We'll say, all right, there's a leaf pack, there's one. All right, give me seven leaf packs over here, and we'll just do tick marks, quantifying how many we see or come across. These, we do actual physical measurements on both the left and right bank. So our magnified beds, overhanging beds, root wads, and undercut banks. So in this case, you might say, all right, we got about one and a half meters of root wads on our right bank, and then we'll go on down. Like, all right, I got another 0.5 meters of root wads on our right bank, and we'll keep quantifying it as we're going down. This right here is our ripple form. And uh, right here, you can kind of see it says ripple start within reach. So as we're doing this, we have a hip chain, which measures how much you walk as you're going um, down the stream. We'll say our ripple is starting at the 27 meter mark. We'll get a channel and wet, wetted width for that ripple and a rough length of that ripple. The longer the ripple is typically the better. And then we'll do a percent of what that ripple is made of. Bedrock, boulder, cobble, gravel, sand. Those are the same parameters that we use for our cross-section pebble, pebble counts. Mm -hmm. So you can have maybe a, a nice long ripple, but if it's 90% sand, that's maybe not a good quality ripple. And all these habitats, different habitat types on this form are scaled and weighted differently to get our final habitat score. So this is kind of just a little case study here of Paw Creek, a little showing of Paw Creek is Wilkinson Boulevard, as you can see right here, 45 and uh, 74. It's not far from our office where we're at now. But um, as you can see, there's not much going on habitat-wise. It's a straight, narrow channel, not much water, a lot of sandbars. You got a little bit of marginal stuff here and there, but as a heavy rain event might occur, this sandbar can fill in that undercut root wide, and now the bugs and critters can't use it anymore. Okay. Next rain event, that might be open channel, and then your sandbar is over here. So that shifting sediment um, that Josh mentioned earlier isn't good for our habitats for neither our fish or our bugs because they can't they don't have the time to colonize the, the habitat areas they might they might want to live in. Now Back Creek, way up here in the university area, Wentwater Street off of Wentwater Street in the back end of the neighborhood is very pretty. This score is one of the highest scores in our county for habitats um, year in and year out. Um, as you can see, the banks aren't very in size, very well stabilized, lots of vegetation, mature trees around it, nice buffer. Mm -hmm. Look at all that different types of substrate. And all that different substrate is also different habitat types for all your different critters that want to live in it. Um, really nice stream. So when we go to fill out our habitat forms for these streams, we've got Back Creek here on the left and Paw Creek here on the right. As you can see, as I mentioned, we do our little tick marks for what we see as we're going down, and then we have our root wads and undercut banks from physically measuring those. And now, if you look at these two sheets, you're probably thinking, well, Back Creek and Paw Creek, habitat count-wise, looks like they're pretty similar. They kind of got the same stuff going on number-wise. Might even say Paw Creek has a couple more things going on, especially with the undercut banks. Mm -hmm. But what really affects it is when you look at the transects, you look at Paw Creek, a lot of sand, B stands for sand, B, 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 <laughs> sand. You look at that water depth, zero, 0 0.01, zero. So that's a sandbar right in the middle of the channel right there. Whereas you look at um, Back Creek over here, got a lot of cobble, a lot of boulder, a little bit more water depth. You got more pool, 0.13, a lot more different hydrology going on there that allows for the different biota as far as bugs and fish to inhabit and live in. And then here's the other telling sheet is the riffle sheet. The riffle sheet for Back Creek, lots of riffles in Back Creek, whereas Paw Creek, not a single riffle. And the one thing we did forget to do on this slide is to show the final habitat score for each one. Oh, yeah. um, our habitat scores are go up to 200. 200 is the max you can get habitat score wise at, at a stream. We don't have any streams that ever max out 200, but Back Creek comes close. It's probably scored in regular in the 170s, mm -hmm. maybe even skirting the low 180s. Whereas Paw Creek, you're probably getting barely in the 80s every time we score it. Um, not having riffles and not having that diverse substrate type really hurts our streams when it comes to a habitat standpoint. Also, this is what we call our hit list. These are our man-made hit lists. As I mentioned, Rip Rat, Gabion Banks are like the chicken wire cages filled up with rocks that, um, if any of y'all are familiar with uh, Little Sugar Creek down there at the hospital, Atrium Hospital in the Greenway right there, a lot of Gabion Banks. Um, obviously, any kind of outfall direct um, point source outfalls, utility work, sewer line crossings, power line crossing, bridges, et cetera. And other, we do have some livestock, not many anymore, but a few livestock um, impaired, not impaired, but areas where livestock access streams and might damage the bank or things like that nature. And also looking at a little bit of sinuosity there. 
And as you can see, Back Creek has none, and Paw Creek, you already are eight points in the hole right there because of some of the impairments, man made impairments. So, bug sampling techniques. Um, this just kind of shows a couple quick pictures of the main items we use to sample our bugs. To our left here is what we call our kick net. This is what we use to sample our ripple. So, when you have a ripple, you'll set this up downstream. Someone will be holding it about a 45 degree angle, just like that, and let the water flow through it. You kind of read the ripple. You kind of want to see where the flow is going through that net, and you want to um, make sure it's capturing most of that flow. And then the person who's helping you out will stand about right at the edge, will start off right here at the edge, and they will work their way back about six feet and come forward six feet, disturbing that substrate. And as they're doing that, they're going to see where that turbidity plume, that cloud that you're kicking up, they're going to see where it's kind of flowing and traveling and making sure that it's getting through this net. If it starts bouncing off to one of the sides, you either need to get some rocks and maybe build just up a berm on each side, or the person holding the net can just kind of scooch it over a little bit, depending, and uh, be able to capture everything that you're disturbing that's going into our net. When it comes to the benthic community, ripple were typically our most productive habitat type. A lot of different organisms love to live in ripple because you have a lot of fast moving water. So a lot of the benthic critters have external gills so they need moving water to flow across their body so they can breathe. And then they also want well the well oxygenated water and they also want the cooler water. They don't want to cook. So they want this nice cool ripple that has a lot of oxygen and the water temps are typically lower. And there's usually a lot of nice rocks and maybe woody debris and leaf packs caught up all up in here that these bugs will inhabit. These sweet nets right here, what we used to sample all our little microhabitats. And the microhabitats is one of those previous forms um, that had the root wads, the undercut banks, the pools even, the, the leaf packs, things like that, the woody debris. This is what you can use to sample your, um, your microhabitats and collect the, all those organisms. We dump it all in this bucket. This bucket has a, a mesh sieve on the bottom. We pour water over the net. We get all the critters. And then we pick them. We preserve them in ethanol. And then we bring them back to the uh, to the lab. And this is shaky right here looking at a chronomid larvae on the microscope. And we do all our identifications in-house. And um, we send some out for QA, QC, and we do an in-house QA, QC. And this is kind of an end result of one of our sites. This is Back Creek. This is Coal Beach. So I have a real pretty stream up there in the university area. And as you can see, these tolerance values are already preloaded. They're already in there. So these are our tolerance values right here. And then down here at the bottom, we have our total taxa, the NCBI, which gets automatically computed. EBT is on um, mayflies, caddisflies, and stoneflies. This is kind of a different indices. Some quick and dirty ways to do a quick stream assessment from a benthic standpoint is to just look at those three types of organisms because they are typically the ones that have the more intolerant species are in this group. So sometimes we'll just look at that. So we have that up there, but we go by the NCBI and uh, that computes again, that looks at total taxa, that looks at all your species you've collected. Um, and then this is your EPT number, how many EPTs we found at that site. And then that automatically computes our, our classification for that stream. You have excellent, fair, good, fair, poor, so there's a few different classifications based off that final NCBI score. And Shakey's going to take over with the fish sample. Thank goodness. Let's stop talking about bugs. So my absolute most favorite thing in the whole entire world, the fish program. We do this as well. The stream restorations, like we've talked about before, the bugs are king. They're going to tell you a whole lot more about water quality any time of the day. But the fish are there. We'd like to know what's there in the stream trying to survive before a project gets even bid on, before it even starts busting ground. And then subsequently, once the project is finished, we can go out again and, and do that same survey, the same exact effort in that project to try to figure out what has the fish population done? What has come in? What has left? What has changed? So that's where I come into play. And here's kind of what we do. All of our work is with a backpack electroshocker. Uh, we don't do any barge shocking. And obviously, we don't do any boat shocking, unfortunately. Uh, so we'll go up in a stream with a, a good group of people that are wanting to have fun that day and we'll shop the reach. The reach is 200 meters long because fish can move more than the bugs can. So we try to encompass the same 100 meter bug and habitat assessment reach as we go up the stream with the fish reach. So we try to kind of put it either in the middle or kind of near the beginning of our fish sampling reach. So we'll shock as a team upstream collecting each and every fish that we can 
Somebody, as you can see right there at the bottom left of the screen, will have a bucket. They are super important to make sure that the fish are staying alive. They can switch out the water with clean, clear water if they need to. But keeping the fish alive and making sure we're doing what we're supposed to with these fish is super important to that person. You obviously have a netter as well, helping you catch them all that might go by you, especially in a ripple like that. So after we've gone upstream, we'll wait five or 10 minutes, let everything calm down. And we're at the 200 meter mark, and then we go right back downstream again to get a full assessment because maybe some of those fish shot up past us, shot by us. We want to go ahead and follow what the state protocol is, and that's what the state of North Carolina does when they do it. So we follow that. Once we've done that, we've gone up and down, and we feel like, yep, we've got what we think we're going to get. We get to sit down and relax, and most people take their waiters off, get a cold drink and start playing with fish, which is what most people enjoy about the day. Netting the fish is fun, but getting there to, to ID and see all the fish up close is, is the real fun part. So we ID every one of them that we can in the field with a field guide and a couple of other cheat sheets we've got. But we know most of the common players. And the shiners are the hardest ones to ID because some of them are even by scale shape and fin rays. And you're talking a fish that might be two inches long. So a lot of them get to come home to the office where we look at them under microscopes and we really pull out a bunch of different guides to help us learn what species are. So some of those get brought home, but most of the fish go right back to the stream when we're done. So once we've done all that tallying and writing down, we put it into our fish database that we have created in-house. Uh, the fellow that used to run the program before me sat down with our IT guy and built this from scratch. So each of our fish have a tolerance value, have a, a, a rare or not rare value associated with them, just like the bugs. And we put which species we found, how many we found them, and this super duper computer on the right gives us our printout of what that creek section is behaving like at that time. So again, just like with the bugs, you have an NCIBI score rating. This one in particular was from Long Creek at Pine Island Drive. That's MC14A. That's kind of up near 485 in the Mount Holly at the Huntersville Road area. Uh, this would come out as 36 with a fair. And then it tells you why down below it with the number of species we caught that day, how many fish, it goes so on and so forth. And then it even talks about how many tolerant fish, which ones are omnivores, insectivores, piscivores, even how many were diseased, and if we had multiple ages within each species, which we always want to see because that lets us know that they're thriving in there and they're having spawns. So that is pretty much how the fish work. And basically what I'm going to run through right now, and any of my people can, can run in as they need to on this, what I'm showing right here is what we would like to see naturally on the left and what we hope we have created through a stream restoration on the right. So a shallow rocky riffle. You heard Matt talk about it. You heard Josh talk about it. That's probably our most dominant necessity of a habitat type that we have. And as you can see, what we're hoping to find there on the left top of your screen is your flathead mayflies. And anytime you want to walk down a stream and you see this, if you flip a rock, you will find these cute little fellows right here holding on to it real tight. Uh, basically, they're like the cows of the bug world. They, they crawl underneath the rocks and graze the algae and the organic material off of it. They're super sweet and cute, and they're everywhere. So if you want to look for them, you'll find them. The fish version of that is our little fantail darter. He's a little more rare than the tessellated darter, which is extremely common in habitats where he thrives. But the fantail is a little more rare, a little more intolerant, but he loves this kind of water. He sits on the bottom. His pelvic fins have actually been designed to be little tripod feet that sit down because they do not have swim bladders. So they do not float to the surface, even when you shock them, which makes them real, real hard to catch when we're doing our electric fishing. So somebody usually keeps on the eye out for our darters and our ripples when we're shocking. But super cute little fella. He lives in ripples and he basically faces upstream all the time eating little bugs as they fall down. But these are the type of creatures you'd be looking for in this habitat type. Again, deep pools. Okay, so if we're going to have pools in these in these stream restorations as well, we need some variable habitat. And this picture on the top left is of McDowell Creek at Beatty's Ford Road. That's our site, MC4. It's a very popular site. We've been monitoring it for years, and it goes pretty quick into Mount Island Lake. So I'm real happy about this one. I always try to keep an eye on it. And here is another part of McDowell Creek up at Gillian Road. This is one we're going to talk about a little bit more in a little bit. You can see me swimming. It's so deep in there while we're doing our transect measurement. My buddy Tim wasn't real happy with me, but I enjoyed taking a swim in the summertime. 
So in these pools, you can guarantee that you're going to find these two gorgeous little sunfish right here. My favorite is a green sunfish because he thinks he's bigger than he is and he likes to fight bass bait, so that makes me happy. But basically, your red breast sunfish will be found anywhere you have water deep enough for them to live. They're absolutely gorgeous during the spring spawning times when the males get all colored up and they're super easy to go find. So if you got kids or grandkids, they can go find these fish in May, June, July, and they're absolutely beautiful. So don't, don't ignore those guys. And our predaceous diving beetles, a lot of our different little diving beetles will have to live in the slower moving water. They are not built for living in shallow rocky ripples. So these are the type of bugs we expect to see in deeper pools. And you'll see these guys, believe it or not, both of these pictures are in streams in Mecklenburg County in urban environments. And I threw this in there to give you all ha ha and gorging you with my obsession with fishing. But actually, I have started bass fishing in the urban streams in Charlotte. So if you see me in a pretty Kilroy kayak floating down laughing, just ignore me. I'm enjoying myself and I'm fine. But... If you don't think you can catch decent fish in creeks in downtown Charlotte, you're wrong. So give me a call and I'll take you to something sometime. So our root wads, well, we've talked about a little bit more. And Maddie hit on it a little bit about, you know, our fibrous root wads being a habitat. Your dragonfly larvae love that. They love hanging into those and hiding out of the current and using that lower jaw to reach out and grab uh, prey as it goes by. They're severe, huge predators. A lot of people think dragonflies, dance flies are real sweet, pretty little things. They're predaceous hawks flying around. If you really research them, dragonflies are some of the coolest bugs we have in the water and in the air. So as a restoration, we try to mimic this with this towwood effort, with putting on layer, like Hannah said, layer, layer, layer of fibrous woody material so that when that stream does flood it, there is that habitat for Mr. Yellow Bullhead right here, which is a very popular catfish that we get in our creeks. They're super cute, but if you handle them, be careful because those Pectoral fins and that dorsal fin right there will get you if you're not careful, but we love our little catfish around here. And then log jams. They look bad. They look kind of nasty. They stop up the creek, but they do provide habitat. A lot of your bluegill sunfish that are in your streams, they want the slowest, most cover water they can find. So bluegill are going to hide up in these log jams and eat these guys off of the log. So this is a midge larva. It's a non-bite midge. You heard Maddie say a little bit earlier, this is a coronamid. It basically, as it hatches into an adult, looks like a mosquito with furry antennas. They will not bite you, but go ahead and smack them because you're going to. But that's what a coronamid is. And then once in a while, in our clean, clean, pretty creeks, we will get to find some really awesome casemaker caddisflies. So they use a glue that they secrete to form a perfect geometric house over the rest of their body that they tote around like a mobile home. And if you want to do a little bit of research on casemaker caddisflies, you will be incredibly amazed at what they're able to do. We are nothing with building houses like they are. It's, it's actually amazing. And that ties into what we've just got done talking about a little bit about intolerant versus tolerant species. So the, the fish and the, the, the bugs that are intolerant means they have to have something. They are very specifically needing something to exist there. And that's what we just got to talking about. And Mr. Little Tessellated Darter here is going to sit on the bottom in those pretty ripples. And if they're not there, he's not going to make it. His eggs are going to get covered up. He's going to die out. And they're not going to be there anymore. And it's the same thing with the common stonefly. He actually has gill puffs underneath his body right here. And if there's too much sediment in the creek and it's too polluted, he's going to bust out of there. They're just not going to exist. You find these everywhere in your pretty mountain streams. So next time you're in the mountains crawling around, you should be able to see some common stoneflies. Again, versus super tolerant, which means if there's water, they will be there, are, like we mentioned before, the red breast sunfish and these net spinner caddisflies, which have to have just a little bit of flow and something hard on the bottom to build a web that they lay in like a hammock, and food gets washed into them, they pick it off the net, eat, and lay back down. So that is, anytime you're walking around any of these restorations or the greenways, and you see some rocks with little brown little pocket hoops that's typically what you're seeing is a net spinner cast fly net. So I am probably getting ready to hand it off. This is a case study that Mr. DeMar is going to talk about. We're looking at two different phases of a stream that was in badly need of help. So on the left here, pre-construction, we're dominated by sand and sediment everywhere. There's little to no vegetation in the creek, hanging over in the bank. It's naked tall banks. 
and zero stream bed habitat options. The rocks, there are none. There's hardly any wood in the creek. It's a flat, sandy alleyway versus post-construction. The sand and the sediment are allowed to move through thanks to Josh's profile and pattern and all that great stuff. The overhanging veg is growing up. Miss Hannah's got a natural berm here of grass and plants hanging over. And we've got a variety of stream bed habitats for me and Maddie to catch our bugs and fish in. So that's what Josh is going to talk about next. All right, uh, I know we're running a little short on time, so I'm going to try to move through these case studies relatively quick. Um, the first one we want to hit on is uh, McDowell Creek, um, which is west side of 77 that um, flows to Mountain Island, which is our watershed supply, um, as many of y'all know. Um, so we restored 1,300 linear feet, which is around two and a half miles of a priority two restoration. In this watershed, just to give you a heads up, um, this uh, whole watershed is on the 303D list, category four for impaired waters for poor ecological and biological integrity for the fish and bugs. Um, so with that being said, um, we did have a SIR score for this project, uh, which the pre-construction conditions, which Dave and Matt and Hannah have all talked about, um, it reached a 139. Um, and then our post-construction scores, it hit a 252, which was an 80% uplift um, using the score, the service score methodology. Um, so significant increase. Um, so right here to the left is a pre-construction condition cross-section. Uh, as Dave has indicated, it's very incised, entrenched, um, doesn't have a lot of floodplain connectivity. And you see post-construction, um, is a stabilized channel with floodplain connectivity um, and good uh, base flood water availability for the biodiversity. Um, speaking of biodiversity, we also look at the longitudinal profiles of a stream. So water flow is moving from the left side of the page to the right. Um, so this representative lawn pro um, as you can tell, had minimal bed form diversity with one pool being measured and depth variability was not much. So poor uh, depth um, for habitat. Um, so post-construction, you can definitely see we have long ripples and we have depth variability with these pool types. Um, and that allows for the increase of biodiversity um, and uh, habitat. Okay, so real quick, I threw this together just to show what our data has told us uh, with bugs versus fish. So this is that same reach that Josh is talking about. It's the McDowell Creek at Gilead Road, MC2A1. So combining all of our pre-construction data and our post-construction data and averaging those numbers out, the bugs are there on the left. Our NCBI score didn't change very much, but that's very incremental. It went up, you know, one-tenth of a point. But if you look at the EPT numbers, that's the, the mayfly, stoneflies, and caddisflies, we doubled the amount of species pre-construction to post-construction. Our EPT individual count come up. So 188 of those bugs went to 251 every time we went out. The number of species almost doubled. And the total number of bugs that we picked out of that stream used to average about 287 it has gone up to 516. So the bugs have told the story that the restoration has worked for them. The fish on the other hand on the right, like we've said before, they're not quite as indicative of an upgrade in situations based on a stream restoration. Now, what we didn't want to see was any of these numbers just straight plummet in the blue columns, and they have not. So while our IBI score has gone down, that's because we probably included a lot more deeper pools here and a lot of those little skinny minnows have left. And now we're getting bigger, healthier sunfish, which is fine by me because that's what a largemouth is. So our number of species didn't really drop that much. The number of fish actually did go up. They can live in those deeper pools that Josh was able to create. Our sunfish species went up and our percent of fish species with multiple age groups. That means they're actually having babies that are surviving has all gone up now from 54 to 65. So that's all good stuff shown by our fish and our bug sample. All right, next one we're gonna hit on is uh, Stevens Creek, uh, which is the Goose Creek watersheds, the east part of the county. Um, 
It was a priority one restoration for about almost two miles. Um, the upper reach of this is what's considered a critical habitat for the federally endangered Carolina hill splitter. Um, and uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg did receive a grant from U.S. Fish and Wildlife to create six different mussel habitat structures for this project, which we'll kind of hit on. Um, so pre-construction scores for this project obviously scored a little bit better with a 169. Um, Post-construction, we went up to 279, so it's 65% up left. Um, so here are some pre and post uh, pictures of the, the channel itself. Um, so as you can tell on the left, um, moderately entrenched and incised, and then post-construction, you now have a stable um, shape um, a channel that allows um, for vegetation growth um, as well. Um, same thing with the longitudinal profile, going from left to right, you had a little bit more ripples, uh, pre-construction and depth variability with the pools, uh, but obviously nothing like the post-construction with the, the longer ripples and the more deeper pools allow for the fish to, and bugs to thrive. Uh, one thing I did want to push on this project was, uh, since this is priority one, we did get a lot more pattern in this project. So pre-construction is the picture to your left. It's uh, minimal um, sinuosity. As you can tell, post-construction, we have a lot more meanders and bends. So that really gets the ripple pull sequencing. And I just overlaid both of those just so you can tell the difference of the alignment um, and what they did in this project. Um, so here's just some pictures of um, a landmark that the engineer took of this uh, tree right here. So you can tell the difference. Um, night and day, uh, you have a lot more uh, channel degradation on the left. You have a lot of sloughing of banks. And afterwards, post-construction, you have a very stable channel with native vegetation growing, uh, tow wood going on here and outside bend. So great. Um, project. Um, here's another thing they did since we got pattern, they moved the channel away from this house. Um, so that means that you will not have more property loss. Uh, so this person was very grateful for that. Um, so the, the errors just show um, where the channel used to be and what it is now. Um, and this is a picture taking the same exact location um, pre and post construction. So you can definitely tell the difference um, with what stream restoration can do can do and help uh, a channel. So I'll hit real quickly uh, with the Carolina Hills Blur Habitat. These are the structures that were put in. Uh, like I said, there were six of those. Um, these allow for the finer um, uh, materials to deposit in these so the, the animals can go vertically. Um, and Matt will give you a little bit more information on uh, the tagging of some of these animals. Yeah, this is our, our last little slide. So thanks for uh, hanging out with us. I know we've gone a minute or two longer than we probably should have. But uh, anyway, as Josh mentioned, these are geo cells. They're hoping to, to establish a Carolina Hill splitter, splitter an endangered species mussel. And uh, these geo cells have never been used before in any restoration project in the nation. So this is one of a kind. And uh, so these got put in, they're basically big honeycomb type of heavy duty material, plastic material that then get buried and they fill these little individual honeycombs up with the suitable substrate for, for the uh, hill splitter and other mussels. But before they start seeding it with hill splitters, they wanted to know is, hey, will it even just let any kind of mussels live? So what we did is we went to the Goose Creek and Stevens Creek watershed, both in Mecklenburg and over into Union County and collected the elliptio mussel, which is a very common freshwater mussel found in our streams, our better streams. And um, we gathered up as many as we could find in these other reaches and brought them back and we put radio transmitter taggers on them. The radio tagger was about the size of a grain of rice. It's the one that most field biologists use for fish, these kind of mussels. I mean, they can put it on pretty much anything. And uh, using JB weld, JB weld and super glue is what we use to attach them to the mussels. So we attach these radio transmitters into the mussels, and then in different areas of Stevens Creek, um, these different spots where these GSOs were installed, we physically put these tagged mussels into these honeycomb webbing um, structure. And uh, Fish and Wildlife was actually supposed to come out. We did this last year, 
and they were going to come out, shoot, it wasn't even a month ago, to uh, do a survey to see how many have survived, how many are left, how it worked out. But um, I think the remnants of a tropical storm were blowing through, and uh, the weather wasn't conducive, so they had to postpone and cancel. And to my knowledge, they haven't been able to uh, get it back on the calendar yet to get back out here. But uh, hopefully here in the next, um, maybe in the next couple of months, we'll be able to get out there and kind of see how these how these mussels work. They're kind of the guinea pig. Because um, if these, for some reason, didn't take or don't work in these structures, then they'll know that the hill splitter won't. But if these thrive and take off and start working, then that's a good indicator that, hey, we might be able to put hill splitters in these structures and they're going to be able to survive and thrive and try to get that, that endangered species recolonized in our streams. Um, so with that said, like I said, thank you for staying up late with us. That's mm -hmm. all we've got. Uh, I can turn on the Q&A tab here, which we didn't have on during our talk. So... Sorry if y'all were asking us questions and we totally ignored you because we did because we didn't have it up. Um, with that said, after we can try to roughly look over these some of these questions or if uh, people want to pipe up or Donna, you can facilitate however y'all want to work it. Okay, um, let me go through some of the chat questions. For, here's a great one. Since pollution was a problem initially mentioned, um, th this is from Dawn. Are there any volunteer opportunities to help with cleaning up the banks of the rivers and streams? Um, <laughs> So we have, I think it's still going on. We actually have a whole group dedicated to uh, education and volunteer outreach. Um, the, the lady who's taking care of that now is named Ashley Smith. She's in our office. She's two seats away from me, and she manages our cleanups. We actually just helped with River Sweep uh, the first Saturday in October. We were present at Mountain On Lake and a couple other places. Um, but she has invented something called Second Saturday Cleanup Events. So I think they're still going on. She's dealing with COVID like all of us have been, uh, but I believe she is still doing that. So Ms. Ashley Smith would definitely be an easy contact for anybody who wants to do some volunteer work for sure. There was a question too, whether you could list your species that you're, that you're planting, a quick rundown of what some of the species are that you plant. Well, we plant a lot of um, sycamores, um, elderberry, mm -hmm. a lot of that, a lot of willow, um, silky dogwood is a big one. We have like all different um, straight ups like grasses and sedges. We, we use like um, bulrush a lot. Just And somebody asked about whether the mussels were a keystone species. Mussels are definitely kind of like some, some of our insects are very sensitive to the aquatic environment where as we know, they're filter feeders, and not only that, they need they need a fish to be able to uh, procreate, to uh, to have catch their babies to the fish gill, but the fish gill fish carries them on. Um, and some mussels are very specific to the type of fish that they will use as their host, basically. So it's kind of a a multi layered facet that if you don't have the fish air that the certain mussel needs, then that mussel can't procreate. And um, Vice versa, if the fish is there, but then maybe you get a lot of sediment, you got a lot of turbidity and those, those mussels can't survive. Or again, mussels are very specific to the substrate type that they embed in. Um, some mussels, you know, need that sand silt, other ones like the, the pea gravel, things like that, and are able to, um, to survive. So again, I don't know if that quite answers the question as, as a keystone species. Uh, unfortunately, again, we're not experts on mussels, and we do have, um, for instance, the Asiatic clam, the corbicula, we find in a lot of our streams because they can survive in dirty water. And not only that, they don't need that fish host to uh, procreate. They can just have their babies anywhere. Do you regulate water treatment facilities and their demand in regards to the population increase? Also, how do these facilities impact our natural water sources? So I'm going to assume that that means Charlotte water intake devices, I think. And if I go on that assumption, then we don't regulate that. What we do regulate is the water quality around them. So if anything were to be coming out of there that would damage water quality in Mountain Island Lake, which is the biggest one, uh, they do have a water intake on Lower Lake Norman as well in the Blythe Ramp area of Lake Norman. If you know that area, they've got that really pretty walkway out to a big old structure. Uh, we monitor both of those just about monthly. The Mountain Island one is the big one. It takes up about 75 to 80 percent of Charlotte's drinking water every single day. Uh, if you're in Charlotte and using the water, it's almost probably coming from there. Um, 
So we monitor that one every month. The wastewater treatment facilities, I would say yes, right? Don't we watch that like a hog? Yes, we do. We don't. We don't have. I guess our, a lot of our monitoring sites are downstream of their of their fluid um, discharges. So from that standpoint, we we do. And then also we have our municipal and industrial monitoring group, and they actually inspect these facilities on a regular basis. Right. Also, yeah. um, some of our <laughs> routine sampling sites are downstream of these effluent discharges. Coupled with their fact, our industrial and municipal monitoring group does inspect them on a regular basis, yeah. and then the facilities themselves will self-inspect. And then there's a question, is human potability of stream and other waters in your purview, is that a metric? Well, that would go into what class the water body is, I think. Uh, one thing we've been dealing with recently uh, in our area is people swimming in creeks a little bit um, in the summertime, and a lot of it's going on like around um, the parks and the greenways and things like that, which I mean, I'm all for it, but what we have to let the people know is those class waters are not designated for swim areas. I mean, they're just not, it's a creek and it could have anything in it at all. So uh, the, what we monitor for is water quality. So we have standards of human interaction with things like fecal coliform bacteria or E. coli. So when we go and do these samplings, we will, we will get the results from that. And if we need to let people know to stay out of swim areas on lakes and things like that, because we monitor public swim areas on Mount uh, or on Lake Norman and another one on Lake Cornelius, that little fella on the opposite side of 77, uh, where the Lake Norman YMCA is. They have a swim area for kids over there and we monitor that because those are known designated swim areas. Most of our creeks and lakes are really not designated as swim areas. So we watch them for water quality. We'll let people know if there's a problem, but we're not trying to keep them off swimming pools. We also have our um, our erosion control and BMP and SCM group, and they're the ones with all this construction going on and everything else. They'll go to make sure that these these construction sites are trying to, within again their permit requirements, um, keeping back any of their sediment load or any of their their erosion um, from those types of job sites. So between everyone in our group. And then we have our pollution prevention group, and they're the ones who kind of maintain our, our equipment that's in stream that can give us real time readings. Where if everything's fine and we haven't had any rain, but all of a sudden DO crashes in the stream, it'll send an alarm to the person who's in charge of monitoring that piece of equipment. And they can say, Well, why is dissolved oxygen just drop out of the stream all of a sudden? And we'll send a crew out there to do a, a quick investigation, and there might be a sanitary sewer overflow which caused the DO to crash. And we're able to, to find that, investigate it, and try to get it stopped or prevent it from happening. And uh, to kind of do a plug for, I guess, our 311 and volunteer stuff, we do rely on all our citizens because um, there's 3,000 miles of streams in the county and 40 of us in the office. So we definitely rely on y'all to mm -hmm. keep an eye on our streams too. So if y'all ever buy a stream, it smells bad, looks bad, smells funny, tastes fun, don't drink it. <laughs> um, whatever the case is, call 311 and say something ain't right with the stream and we'll come running. Okay. Um, I have a question from Margaret. If 30 miles has been restored since, two, since about 2003, I think you said, how much is now being restored annually? Josh, you want to take over for that? So right now, um, mid year mitigation tries to average three miles per year. Um, and obviously, funding is a big issue. So if you go to that website with that interactive map, um, it'll tell you the cost um, of some of these projects that were put in the ground. Um, I think in the future, we're expecting to do more than that, um, but that's still to be determined as we move through uh, the next couple of fiscal years. But as right now, we're averaging three miles a year. Um, is there any record of what these streams might have looked like pre-colonial era? I don't know if there's a way to view any kind of layout or measurements or any kind of scope for pre-colonial. I know that one cool little trick uh, is not pre-colonial, but you can type in Mecklenburg County Time Machine uh, into your browser anytime, and it's going to give you the availability to look at aerials back from 1978 or even earlier probably beside, right beside uh, the most up-to-date aerial. So whenever we're looking at how fast the development is happening uh, in an area on the lake shore, which is my main focus, uh, what I'll do is I'll go back in time in stair steps and look and see at when certain phases of a development 
uh, were created and were built out and were designed and things like that. So I can look at my lake data and let that tell me more about when a certain cove or part of the lake was affected by development. So and here's a, a question from Kristen. Can you recommend a means to filter suburban swales uh, to remove herbicides and pesticides coming onto my property and impacting my rain gardens? Like maybe a charcoal sock or, do you, you know, whatever. Do you have any suggestions? Mecklenburg County Soil and Water Conservation District. Uh, Leslie Vanden Herrick is, is in charge of that. She's in our office too. They have urban cost share programs to allow, to help alleviate some of the cost of implementing urban swells or whether it's a rain garden or whether it's, it's anything like that um, on your property for, for water quality purposes. Um, again, that doesn't answer the question directly, but uh, Mecklenburg County Soil and Water Conservation, um, Urban Cost Shares, uh, and Jeanette is a lady you probably talked to, but anyway, they can help offset some of the cost of doing things to your yard to help prevent runoff or even from runoff from coming onto your yard. Yeah, we had had someone um, actually post a question to, on our Facebook page and wondering if there were any I don't know if you would know about these or not, but like private companies that help with like the, the stream restoration on private properties, would, would soil and water be who they would contact about that? Yeah, soil and water, uh, they do a lot of uh, call sharing um, and do site repairs um, for some of these projects. So like you said, uh, Leslie uh, would be the point of contact for that. Dave and Matthew, Josh and Hannah, we certainly thank you for sticking with us this long. Um, it's a really interesting program. Thank you everybody um, for tuning in with us and we will see you next month on the second Tuesday, second Tuesday, seven o'clock. All thank right, you. good night. Thank you all for sticking with thank us. Thank everybody. Bye-bye.